And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. So there I will store up all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have made ample goods laid up for you for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. My mama You know it's going to be a southern sermon when you start it out with mama. My mother, or mama, I guess, always told me, and before you roll your eyes, uh, always told me that when you're young, you're invincible, or you think you're invincible. And this is the part I don't want you to roll your eyes at. The older I get, the more I realize that she was right, but I'm learning it in slow, painful ways. My body reminds me that I'm getting older and that I'm not invincible every day. Last night, or the night before, I was at Black Mountain and I slept on an air mattress. And, my, and when I woke up, I had the worst back pain since before I had surgery. I got hurt sleeping. <coughs> I knew I was no longer in, invincible. And only at 36. <laughs> my point is this. When you're young, you do think that you will live forever. You always have time for the next thing. There's always tomorrow. And then when you come to an older uh, person, let me put it this way, a wiser person, they say what? You are not promised tomorrow. Right? That's what they say. And the kid goes, I've got lots of tomorrows. A world full of tomorrows. I've got big plans for my life. One of the things that your parents told you as you were growing up is that you can be anything that you want to be. And today I'm starting to believe that it's true. If you want, if a boy wants to be a girl, apparently that's okay. If a man wants to identify as a frog, I suppose we have to respect that. We're being forced to respect it. You identify anything that you identify with, you're being, we are being forced or coerced into saying that that thing is true. I ran into this for the first time at the Crawdad Stadium when a person came up to me and asked me where another person was and I had never seen them before, didn't know who they were, and the person said to me, whenever you find them or see them, tell them they was looking for them. And I went, as a uh, as a student of the language of language, it didn't register until I think she walked away, and it finally hit me that that was the first time that I had ever been asked to use a pronoun other than binary ones. It was weird, but anyway, the point being, you can be anything you want to be in this world, apparently. What that used to mean is that you can grow up to be the president of the United States if you want to. That was always the, the example that my parents used. At this point, I'm like, who wants that? But the, uh, that, you, know, you can grow up to be an astronaut. You can 
grow up to be whatever you want to be. As long as, long, as, long as you put your mind to it, you can do it. America, the land of opportunity. You have the freedom to search out your success. You have the promise that you can pursue happiness. The, by the way, that's not the promise of happiness. There's a very big difference. You have the right to the pursuit of happiness. So then it brings me to this question. What is happiness? When, when we talk about uh, things such as misgendered or change gendered or truly uh, mental issues that they feel better in this way or happier in that way, uh, it, it's, it's more obvious to our eyes that we can see that they're not happy with a lot that was given. But what's less obvious is in you. You're not happy. There is something in you that makes you not happy. There is something about you that makes you unhappy. And that's okay. Because it's not my job and it's not Jesus' job to make you happy. But let me tell you what it is. You're sinners. And while I know some sin is fun, afterwards, there's always the regret. You can never be happy enough while you are being a sinner. You can never have enough as a sinner. There will always be more and more and more. And we see that in our text as well. There was a man in the parable, a rich man, who produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I've got so much that I don't know what to do with it. And to me, to this day, this still doesn't make economic sense. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones for all my stuff. That'll, that'll fix it. And then I'll have enough to relax, eat, drink, and be merry. I'm young. I'm invincible. I have all the time in the world. Today, at 3 o'clock, we will have the memorial service for Margaret Reed, which should remind us all that we're not promised tomorrow. And also, that as you go throughout your life gathering, uh, uh, gathering grain into your barns, how quickly it can be taken away from you, but also how slowly. If anyone has ever dealt, that's a bad term, if anyone has ever long loved someone with dementia, you know that they slowly lose their grain. And you, you, you lose them twice, truly. I got to know Margaret when I first came here as she was beginning her dementia. And so I did get to know her. And then I slowly saw the grain leave from her barn. And so, when Christ called to her and said, Today, your soul is required of you. What do you have to show for it? Martha, Margaret Reed had nothing to show for it except her faith. 
She couldn't tell you who I was from Adam. Even her family could not tell you who, she could not tell you who they were. No grain, no earthly goods, nothing but faith. So when Christ says to you, your soul is required of you today, what do you have to offer me? What do you have? Show me what you are worth. The one who says, well, I have uh, divested my portfolio quite nicely is not giving the correct answer. Even those who say, Lord, Lord, not all those who say, Lord, Lord, shall be brought into the kingdom of heaven. It's easier for a camel to get to the eye through the eye of a noodle than a rich man needle, noodle, not noodle, needle, than for the rich man to enter into heaven. I would imagine it would be even more difficult for a noodle. My point is this: we deal with things in this world because we have to. We gather up retirement so that we can live. We give because we have received. We tithe and we give money to this church so that it can continue, I don't want to say it, so that she can continue to proclaim the gospel from 1905 to the ends of the earth. That's Augustana's goal, if you will, to proclaim the gospel from 1905 until Jesus comes back and says, I am here. So when that day comes, and Christ says to you, this night your soul is required of you, what do you have that is worth giving? Do not point to your barns. Do not point to your possessions. Do not point to your actions. Do not point to, well, I raised kids and they became a pastor. Or something like that. Which is very common in the Roman Catholic Church, by the way. If you raise a priest, you're automatically in heaven. That's not true, by the way. Um, uh, don't, don't tell my mom. Um, <clears throat> We cannot, when our soul is required of us, we cannot point to the things that we own. We cannot point to the things that we have become sentimentalized toward. When your soul is required of you, I recommend one thing. When asked, what do you have that gives you worth? Walk up to Jesus. Uncurl his hand and point to his wound and say, that's all. That's all I'm worth. Everything that you've given up for me. Die a rich man. Die of dementia. That's all we have. That's it. But here's a blessing. And that that's a blessing as well. But here's an earthly blessing. Where the terrestrial, or where the celestial meets the terrestrial, is that we get this here. A foretaste of the feast to come. That sentence uh, we use often, but what we don't understand is that when it says a foretaste of the feast to come, it means that there's a little bit of heaven on earth. There's Jesus Christ here. And the foretaste also uh, indicates that there's a feast continuing now. That it's, it's our foretaste of the feast to come when we are in heaven. In, a, in other words, when we commune, heaven communes. Seated around the Lamb. 
Everyone in heaven does the same thing. That's why I don't like the phrase, I know Granny's looking down on me today. I sure hope not. Especially not all the time. Because Granny is doing this. Looking at the Lamb on His throne in His kingdom. And so let's do the same. Repent of your sins and come to the wounds of Christ. Because when He says, your soul is required of you this night, be sure that the only thing that you can say is, Lord, I am not worthy to have you under my roof, but just say the word and your servant shall be healed and eat the body of Christ. I will take the cup of salvation and will call upon the name of the Lord. Receive the blood of Christ. Trust me, the barn will long be decayed as you are in eternal bliss with Christ. So while we are here, let us give to the church. Let us give to one another. Let us do the things that we need to enjoy life. But understand that to truly enjoy life means you have to die. Because true life begins in Christ. So if you die before you die, you won't die when you die. Let me explain it. If you die in the waters of baptism before you die in this world, when you die in this world, you will not die for all eternity. And that's all you got. And it's way more than enough. Amen.